Good day, citizens, and welcome to uh, this podcast edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, and welcome. Great fun today, David. We had my friend Char Miller from Pomona College in Southern California on to talk about the reissue of an important book, one that he co-wrote, Ogallala, Water for a Dry Land, along with John Opie and Ken Lang Archer. Ogallala means the Ogallala Aquifer, an underground lake in the western Great Plains that has created one of the great agricultural production zones in the world. And Char Miller is uh, interested in that resource and interested in how finite and unsustainable a resource it is. Yeah, we've talked about water before, and I think we're both of the same mind that, uh, maybe not, but I, I shouldn't assume, but I, you know, I, I firmly believe that as the, the decades progress, water is going to become one of the most valuable uh, natural resources we have, if it isn't already, I guess. Well, in this book, uh, Char Miller and his co-authors say that 40% of the world's population does not have an adequate supply of safe water. Think of that. Yeah. 40%. That's almost half. You, know, we, you and I live in North Dakota. The Great Missouri River is here. It's, it, it, it backs up two gigantic dams, two reservoirs here. We feel we have an infinite amount of water here, and we don't have to be careful. But I lived in Southern California. Uh, I taught at Pomona College at the beginning of my career, and there water is rationed very tightly. There, everyone has a special toilet. Watering restrictions are permanent. People are conscious. At a restaurant, they don't automatically bring you water because you have to ask for it because the water is as precious as can be down there. That's still a place of abundance, but, but that's well, closer a, to the world's model it, than it, ours. It's a good public um, uh, awareness. Uh, I mean, to, to increase public awareness, even if it, you know, I mean, a glass of water here, a glass of water there, compared to what's used for industrial reasons, agricultural reasons, is not much. But the public awareness of it, I, I would. Well, in the California water system, for example, which is one of the world's most extraordinary engineering feats, uh, 85% of that water is used in agriculture. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting. At the very beginning of the uh, discussion that you had with me, you talked about um, how the, the federal government has nothing to do with this. Not much at all. Yeah, it's, it's mostly local irrigation associations where we self-police. Yeah. And it works because these irrigators, they're, they're not idiots. They're aware that it's expensive to pump that water and mm -hmm. that it's a declining resource. And so they're doing what they can to conserve it, at least to to extend the life of the Ogallala. Uh -huh. And they will then have these meetings where they'll say, well, we tried this, we only water at night or only water from 5 to 5, 14 a.m., hey, and it, it works. It was fun to go back to Kansas, in a sense, again, after uh, the show a couple of weeks ago where we broadcast your live performance in Pittsburgh. In Pittsburgh, Kansas. And we're right, still, getting, end, we're still getting mail about that. It I loved a, being there. Yeah. So with that, sir, let's go to this week's show. We're talking with Professor Char Miller, one of the nation's leading historians, particularly environmental historians, the author of a brilliant biography of Gifford Pinchot, a friend of mine who came to our uh, Theodore Roosevelt Public Humanities Symposium in Dickinson, North Dakota in 2017, and he's the co-author of this remarkable book, Ogallala, Water for a Dry Land, third edition, University of Nebraska Press, John Opie, Ken Lang Archer, and Char Miller. Let's, let's go to the program. Good day, citizens, and welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with President Thomas Jefferson. I'm your host, David Swenson, and seated across from me is the creator of the Thomas Jefferson Hour and the portrayer of Mr. Jefferson, Clay Jenkinson. Good to see you, sir. I'm very excited about this week's show. You, uh, you've met someone who has written a very important book, and he has agreed to come on later in the program to talk about it. Could you fill in our listeners? And Mr. Char Miller of Pomona College, where I taught briefly at the very beginning of my wayward career. Uh, Char came to Western North Dakota last year uh, to lecture at a Theodore Roosevelt symposium that I was hosting, and his topic then was Gifford Pinchot, uh, the forester, oh, right. who had such an influence on about that, Roosevelt's yeah. conservation right, policies. Yeah. Char Miller has written a ton of books. He has a distinguished um, chair uh, in, of environmental studies at Pomona College, and he sent me his, his book recently. Um, it's called Ogallala, Water for a Dry Land. The original author was a man named John Opie, uh, but Char Miller and Kenna Lang Archer have revised the book for its third edition. It's University of Nebraska Press. He's an extraordinary scholar. He's written a ton. He has essays. Uh, he's a fabulous lecturer, and he's deeply interested in examining 
the sustainability problem in American life, in our in our forests, in our water supply, in agriculture, and, and the Ogallala Aquifer, for those who aren't aware of it, we'll put some things on the website, jeffersonhour.com, is an underground lake the size of Lake Huron beneath the western Great Plains in uh, the panhandle of Texas, parts of Oklahoma, parts of New Mexico, parts of eastern Colorado, western Kansas, western Nebraska, even parts of Wyoming. It's this gigantic resource, but the thing about it is that it's not rechargeable. It's fossil water. It comes from millions of years ago, and it's just been sitting in these water-bearing sands beneath the western Great Plains, and it was discovered in the 1950s, and since 1960, uh, tens of thousands of farms on the Great Plains have tapped into this resource and made one of the most important agricultural regions in North America uh, over the Ogallala, but people like Char Miller um, remind us that this is not a sustainable resource, that in 50 years or 100 years, we will have pumped the Ogallala dry effectively, and there's no way to recharge it. it, it we would have to wait, he's, I think he says, 6,000 years for it to recharge. You know, who of us hasn't flown over the Great Plains? I remember back in the 80s uh, heading to uh, Dallas, Texas on a plane, and for the first time looking down and noticing all these huge green circles. The green crop circles. Or, and that's the Ogallala. And, right, so and, they're pumping and, water out. You, know, you and I have talked about this before. There was another book, of, uh, Cadillac Desert, that we discussed. Mark Reisner's book. Which is uh, or another really important book. And by the way, just to say, I'm doing the water retreat at Laksaw Lodge in oh, January right. of 2019, so people I'm... should come. We'll be talking about all of this. Yeah. Water in the West. Mark Reisner's Cadillac Desert is sort of the number one first entry well, for into, me this, it was, into this zone, know, yes. This book is is uh, more specifically about One place. Uh, the plains, and it's a very detailed read, but it's pretty fascinating. I lived out there. I lived out there for a couple of years when I was married, uh, right on top of the Ogallala. And did I you think perhaps you'd end up being a farmer in Kansas? Or? I tried. <laughs> <laughs> you want to hear some stories? I think I washed out. <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, I'm an agrarian in the library. I, I was less efficient. On, that should be a bumper sticker. My, my father-in-law was this great man. He was a pioneer irrigator. So back when the Ogallala was just being discovered, he was one of the first to understand it. He was an extraordinary man, and he developed this, this huge four-section farm, nine miles of underground pipe. I mean, he, he was a master at this. And so I when I went out there, I came from my brand of agriculture, which was my grandparents on a small dairy farm in Minnesota of 80-some acres. Oh, right. yeah. And so I went out there, and I suddenly saw a whole different agriculture. And my former wife, Etta Walker, said to, about the kind of farming I talk about, she said, those are farmy farms. <laughs> You're talking about farmy farms. Farmy farms. Farmy farms. <laughs> she said, this is about agriculture. <laughs> and so I, I had to well, learn. Well, you have to give her that. That's, no, she's that's right. good. Yeah. And they were producing food like crazy using this fossil water. And they were all aware that it's a, it's a finite resource, but they thought, what the heck? You know, it's here. Yeah. What are you going to do? Are you going to not tap it? I can't help but think about Jefferson and all of this and how he would react to it. You know, we talk about Jefferson and gardening, but... Jefferson was a farmer, and all of his compatriots were farmers. And you know, it's it's pretty easy to do some research and find out how he thought things were going to work. And the, you know, they were aware of this, the crop rotation. But his big plan was: there's so much land, everybody can be equal by having their own land and producing their own things. And um, I can't imagine that he would have thought of water as a finite resource in his wildest imagination. No, because 44 inches of rain per annum at Monticello, plenty for all the kinds of crops that well, they he, wanted he to Well, he did grow. have an, an ecological bend. You know, the, the stories about him cutting down trees was murder right. and He's, all that. He has a sustainability ethos in Jefferson that we don't have in modern agriculture. But those that group of farmers in that time really had no worries about running out of water. No, because until you get to the western side of the Mississippi River, there's always enough water. That's what John Wesley Powell's great insight was in the in the 1870s, that from the Atlantic coast until at least the Missouri River, it always rains enough. You know, Maybe one year out of 20, there's a drought, but it always rains enough that you're going to get wheat and potatoes and But, but they did have things. dry years in Virginia. Once but, in a uh, while. But, but there was really... 
Nothing mm-hmm. like what we're talking about mm-hmm. on the Great Plains. Right, and there was really no irrigation methods. It didn't was, need you to. You took what you got. Because right? you're going to get crops 19 years out of 20. It would be a little bit difficult if you lived on, say, the top of a mountain and didn't have water, unless, of course, you had a lot of free labor yeah, to well, get it Yeah, well, let's not you. go into okay. that. So then well, I just thought John Wesley Powell, um, in his Arid Lands Report in 1878, one of my heroes, the one-armed Civil War veteran, right. he said that the 100th Meridian— which goes from Bismarck to Pierce, South Dakota, to North Platte, Nebraska, and all the way down. He said, that's the line. And you can, you can actually see it, us being in Bismarck. You, there's eastern North Dakota, on the, and, and, and there's western. Western North Dakota's and, drier, tawnier, always. more russet, more uh, ranching, fewer farms. And beautiful, too. Beautiful in its own way, thank goodness, because yes. if it were Iowa— it wouldn't be beautiful anymore. It would be corn. Careful, I have a sister in Iowa. I've been to <laughs> Iowa many times. So east of the 100th Meridian, said John Wesley Powell, you're always going to get a crop, or virtually always. West of the 100th Meridian, not so much. And so he, you could either leave it alone as kind of a buffalo commons or as ranch land, but if you want to farm it, you're going to irrigate. And so if you take, you know, is this Jeffersonian or isn't it? So Jefferson would say, all right, here's some land that's very fertile, but it lacks water. If there's a way to put water on it, maybe that's a good thing. I mean, it's not clear that Jefferson would condemn irrigation out of hand because he's for human ingenuity. The problem is, as Char Miller points out, it's unsustainable because this is not a rechargeable aquifer and the damage we've done by creating monoculture out there is not good in the long-term holistic sustainability of the Great Plains. It wasn't maybe the smartest thing to do. We might have wanted to leave it as grass and graze it in some way. I, yeah, I, I can't even imagine how at that time anybody could no. even have, I mean, they were killing millions of buffalo because it was, an, you know, a nuisance. And, and, and he talks about Wes Jackson, uh, my friend from the Land Institute at Salina, Kansas. Jackson is a genius and he's been working on a kind of a post-monoculture model for his whole lifetime. But how do we get there from here? I mean, we're, we are inherently an extractive people. We find gold, we take it. We find silver, we get it. There's oil under North Dakota, we frack it. We want zinc, we want copper, we want all these things. We go get them. This is how Western capitalist Northern European culture works. It, it's not a leave it alone culture. It's a what can we do with it culture. Right. And so irrigation makes perfect sense from that point of view. Yeah, I hope I get a chance when when we speak to him to talk, to, uh, ask a question or two about dirt. What do you mean about dirt? Well, he in a, I think it's a first or second chapter. He talks about the uh, scientific makeup of dirt, um, and you know the, the the requirements to have good soil. And what really struck me is talking about farmers during that era not really having the scientific background, but understanding it intuitive, and, right? And then breaking down actually, you know, what's going on biologically in the soil. And so you got to have dirt. You got to have water if you're going to farm. But now. It's a whole different world, David. When I lived out on this farm, my brother-in-law one day was had a, a giant, you've seen them in North Dakota, these giant plastic liquid receptacles there. They hold, well, 1,000 gallons or 10,000 gallons. And he was going to um, fertilize this field of corn. And it was all bunged up. There was some kind of blockage where the water has to go into the spraying mechanism on this sprayer. And so he gets into this tank he takes his shoes off and gets into this tank, and he's got sticks, and he's stirring this to try to unclog it. My view is cancer, cancer. I mean, he's he is waist deep. Is he still living? Oh, yeah, he's fine. But, he, but he's <laughs> well, waist good. deep in herbicides and fertilizers because that's the nature of this. We're talking about the petro-industrial chemical agricultural pyramid. Right. And the soil in some respects, is only the the thing which you use to hold the seed. But it's largely, if you've read Michael Pollan's books, sure. it's largely about how chemistry can make something grow on cardboard if you really want it to. Uh-huh. And so what Jefferson understood that we don't is how to read the soil. That's what you're talking about, how to yeah. understand what's what's going on there. When we look at soil, when I looked when I lived out there, we looked at soil as something that you know, you're going to use, but but if you cut off all of the pesticides and herbicides and fertilizers, not much would grow. 
it grows because we we kill off everything that we don't want in that field and we turn it into monoculture and then we we put steroids into it so that it will grow a giant cob of corn and so it's agriculture of course because it produces food but it is not quite Jeffersonian agriculture in the sense that you, you listen to the soil and determine what you can tease out of it. And there's so much written about that. And I'm sure we'll get into it, but Adams and his... His manure. <laughs> his fascination, obsession, He's really, a real farmer. Jefferson's not a real farmer, but Adams is out there shoveling crap. No, you really want to say Jefferson's not a he's real... He's not a real farmer. He, he, he's an agriculturist. Well, he's a slaveholder. He's, yeah. running, a, he's running a gang well, of slaves. It was a pretty complex program of crop rotation. And but, you know, Joe Ellis, things. our dear friend, says that he never once stood behind a plow, Jefferson. I, I could believe that. You know, he's got somebody else doing that. I could he's believe he's that. in planning with graphs about which field should be perfectly geometric and how, you know, how many acres he's going to plant this year and his crop rotation system and what the prices are in Paris and London and Edinburgh. But he's not out there with a plow under the sky like Hamlin Garland up here in the, on the Great Plains. We'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. We're talking this week about water, a little bit about dirt, but mostly about water. We have a very special guest to speak to, the author Char Miller, who has a new book. Char Miller, Pomona College. He's the W.M. Keck Professor of Environmental Analysis at Pomona. Pomona is in the Los Angeles Basin along with John Opie, the original author of this book, and Kenna Lang Archer. My friend Char Miller has reissued the third edition now of Ogallala, Water for a Dry Land. And it's about this fossil lake in on the Great Plains, which has been tapped and tapped again by industrial irrigation. Jefferson would just love all the science involved in this. He wouldn't believe it, of right? Of course. Yeah. It's amazing. How did you, yeah, yeah. And so, uh, so Char um, is concerned about how dependent we are on industrial agriculture. Yeah, but before, before we talk to him, there's a passage that you noted and talked to me about. Could you read that for I our just listeners? Just give you a sense of Char's prose style. This is the last passage in the in the whole book. Again, it's Ogallala, water for a dry land. Here's what he writes: That is why the Ogallala belongs to the world, because humanity today is a globally dominant species whose needs spin a web of mastery, perhaps illusory, across the earth. When food from a radius of thousands of miles enters a single shopping cart, or when bags of grain stamped USAID avert starvation in Africa's Sahel, the whole world depends upon the Ogallala. As a result, the clear, fresh waters of the Ogallala are being gulped down at ten times their trickling pace of replacement. Over the next fifty years, when the world's food needs multiply five or ten times, the Ogallala waters, fulfilling Adam Smith's 18th century prediction, will become as precious as diamonds. Last last passage in this really remarkable book by a, an extraordinary American historian, Char Miller of Pomona College. So I had the good fortune a number of years ago to live out on the Ogallala Aquifer, David. Uh, my wife, Etta Walker, had a farm right on top of the western fringe of the Ogallala in western Kansas, and it was a pretty amazing operation. Nine miles of underground pipe, a couple of giant V8 engines pulling water from 250 feet wow. below the surface. It was not Jeffersonian agriculture exactly, but it was <laughs> not exactly. It was it was remarkable, and we have the great good fortune to be able to talk this morning with my friend Char Miller of Pomona College, the co-author of a book called Ogallala: Water for a Dry Land. Three authors: John Opie, Char Miller, and Kenna Lang Archer. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Clay. Good morning. When I read your book, I found something really remarkable uh, pretty close to the beginning. You say, you and your co-authors say, that while we normally think of irrigation projects in the West as involving massive dams and canals and irrigation systems and uh, government funding, at least by the state of Colorado, but more often by the government of the United States, what marks the Ogallala irrigation system is a high level of individualism. There is not a gigantic dam that supplies this water, and government 
at least the national government has not played much of a role in this. Can, can you explain that? Yeah, it is actually the most striking thing. And, and um, like, like many of us who study the West and water, that <laughs> would just sort of blew my mind. Um, because it's also one of the most extraordinarily managed landscapes. It's not just the individuals who are doing the work, like you mentioned in your opening, um, in, in Western Kansas or Northern Texas or wherever, but, but any of us who have ever flown across the United States, you look down and you can see the upside down rain, what it's produced in the Ogallala area. Um, and it's, and, and so in a sense, it looks like the Central Valley of California because it's agriculture and it's on a huge scale. But the difference is in Central Valley of California, there, every single river is dammed coming out of the Sierras. There are pumps and moving waterways that have been paid by the federal government, paid by the state government, and to a to an extent, local. But the Ogallala just knocked me out in terms of the degree to which almost none of this activity is funded by the federal government. And, you know, admittedly, the Ogallala was named by a USGS um, geologist. Um, but other than that, you don't see much federal presence. So you have tens of thousands of individual farmers uh, yeah. putting down wells and creating either drip irrigation systems or uh, once in a while now flood irrigation systems. This was done through cooperative arrangements and there is some oversight, but for the most part, each of these is an individual investment in prosperity. It is. Uh, it's an individual gamble in prosperity also. Um, as the Ogallala story unfolds in the book, um, these folks are gambling with everything. I mean, whether they succeed or don't, and the Great Dust Bowl is a dramatic example of the failures um, that so many endured and the consequences that, that flowed west as many moved to places like California to try to reclaim their lives. Um, but But it, it's it's a it's a gamble that clearly farmers for a very long time have been willing to make, not just because the, the payoff is great, but because they so love the place like Western Kansas or or Nebraska, um, can't imagine life elsewhere. And this is just the 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 thing you have to endure is not only the the weather uh, and the brutal winters, but but you get to you get to um, work the land in a way that is not Jeffersonian in scale, but if we go back to your opening and think about the Jeffersonian model of individual farmers, yes, these are large corporate entities at some extent, but many of the people that John did the initial interviews with when the first edition came out several many years ago, these are folks who really, you know, put things together, like the irrigation pipelines. They put everything together uh, to produce really large-scale but family-controlled um, enterprises. So a, a giant landscape in western Nebraska and eastern Colorado and Wyoming and the panhandle of Texas and parts of Oklahoma and New Mexico would probably be able to produce some dryland wheat, but maybe not every year. But thanks to the Ogallala, uh, this has been one of the most productive farmlands in North America. I, I would argue one of the most productive farm, farmlands in the world. It's it's incredible. When you think about California, you think about the Colorado River and the Sacramento River and so on. Whatever the downside is of that sort of irrigation, these are renewable resources. And I think the, exactly. what I want you really to talk about now is how the Ogallala – for all of its abundance, it's a it's a fossil lake the size of maybe Lake Huron, but it is not a sustainable form of agriculture. It is not a sustainable form, and there's where the gamble really comes in, not just in the periodic droughts that wipe out a particular year or set of years' crops, um, but the fact that the Ogallala has been so extraordinarily productive for now a century and let's say 20 years or so, uh, but really not since World War II when gasoline-driven pumps really changed the way and the pace and scale of the irrigation processes. Um, that, that aquifer, that extraordinary fertile aquifer with its fossil water um, is disappearing really quickly. Um, and at least, and I don't think they're cynical. I think many of the really smart sort of economic 
forecasts of this region indicate that they think that water is gone in 2050 in most spaces. Other places have already lost it, and they've had to revert to dry land ag. Um, I think that's what we're going to see over the next 30, 40, 50 years in many places as we try to um, do a bridging process and move, move much of this agriculture elsewhere. But it is also the depressing part of the story. Um, that human beings, because of our technology that has unleashed such creativity, has also unleashed the capacity for us to destroy the very things that we were creating. Um, and as conservative as people might want to be with water, um, it's a little bit too late. And part of it has to do with the Ogallala as a structure. As you noticed, it's not just not sustainable in terms of how we're dealing with it. It also doesn't regenerate at a speed that anyone can forecast or or watch. Well, people say like one or two inches per year of regeneration. Yeah, which is you might as well not regenerate. Um, and actually, the 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 line that we use in the text uh, in the new book is that if you turned off every single spigot, if you turned off every um, flood irrigation and drip irrigation, um, no more water was pumped out of the aquifer at all. It would take 6,000 years to regenerate. Oh, my. So, so that, that gives you scale that we don't usually think about. All right. So when I first moved out there, they were it was largely flood irrigation, which is kind of a gross and inefficient uh, way to irrigate. Yes. Totally, then they went to totally. um, center pivots, and then they went to drop nozzles, and, and some have gone to Israeli-style drop nozzles where yes. the water is being used yes. dramatically more efficiently than it was in 1960. Yes. If, we, if we pursue those sorts of technological conservation measures, how much can we extend this resource? Oh, I think we can extend it a long way. Given the size of this region and the amount of agriculture that's taking place and ranching, um, if you can make radical shifts in the way in which water is deployed now, right now, not, not next week, not two months from now, but right now, uh, which and human beings can't move that quickly. Uh, but if we could, I think you could extend it out at least another 20, 30 years um, and maybe longer than that. Right. We could even dramatically increase the technical capacity of these of drop nozzles and others that that really uh, target roots and nothing more than that. Um, but we also have another dilemma, and it is with the extraordinary um, CAFO, the uh, Consolidated Animal Feedlots, that have really dominated much of this region and thus sucking up gargantuan amounts of water for cattle um, to consume. Um, it's not just uh, the corn or sorghum or soy or whatever else we might be growing. I mean, we can change some of the crops. That might help also less water intensive, as they've done. Cotton is becoming less less significant, not only in the Lubbock area, say, in Texas, but also in the Central Valley in California. They're starting to rip that stuff out because they can't afford to do it. Um, that said, we can do all of the changes technical. We can do all of the changes with the crops, but we have had made such a huge dent in that underground reservoir um, that it's going to be terribly difficult to extend it much beyond, probably much beyond this century. And I mean, we'd be lucky to get that far. Isn't there a self-governing mechanism here? Because when I lived out there, as as the wells begin to drop, you have to sink them deeper. Water is extremely yep. heavy to pump to the surface. The energy costs are skyrocketing. Yep. Uh, so at some point, it becomes prohibitive. You just can't make it cost flow. And so you back off because you, can't, you just can't pay that bill to the natural gas or to, or to the diesel to keep those engines running. Right. Or you go deeper and deeper into debt, which has its own self-limiting um, impact, right? You might lose the farm. So, there, I mean, this is not a lake. This is a, this, these are water-bearing sands. And these are water bearing sands, right? And there and there and there there's a lot of water there, but but getting it is um, it, it becomes an increasingly expensive and difficult proposition and at some point you just can't justify. It. You're not going to get the crop loan. Right, exactly. And I think that's that's where we have seen over the generations um, families have come and gone, corporations have moved in to an extent they've gone under. 
um, in part. Um, and, you know, that's the, the, the federal government hasn't done much with the Ogallala in terms of underwriting the process of pumping, but it's done a lot to subsidize crops. Um, and so the question will be whether that's a political decision that the nation wants to make um, to enable families or, or corporations to enable large agricultural activity to continue to occur in the Ogallala. But you can't do it without water. So we're back to that issue, and I think your twining of water with fuel and the cost of that, the energy cost, is absolutely right. And I think it's a conundrum that for places like the Ogallala region, which depends on an aquifer that doesn't regenerate terribly quickly, um, they're in trouble. The contrast to that is to go just a little bit south to the Edwards Aquifer in the central part of Texas, which is a limestone aquifer that recharges almost instantaneously. You have a thunderstorm and that water is rolling into that aquifer and is replenishing, regenerating that extraordinary uh, space. But, you know, ag has largely moved out of that region, but there's a, an, an incredible difference not so far away. Um, you know, geology giveth and geology taketh away. And you've got some aquifers in the Los Angeles Basin that also serve as rechargeable yeah. storage basins. Well, let me ask this other question. Why does this matter? So if there's a mountain in, in Nevada that has gold in it, we go get the gold, and at some point the gold is gone, and then we uh, yeah. cover it up and move on. So we found this resource. It's a, It looked like an infinite resource of aquifer. Uh, we use it up maybe in 2070. It no longer is acceptable. Uh, it's, it doesn't make any sense economically. And and we go back to dryland agriculture or to grazing. Does this matter in any larger sense? Are, are, there, are there lessons to be learned here? Is there an ecological cost to this? There is an ecological cost, and I love that, that framing of it. I think we fundamentally transformed the plains transform them in a way that I think is perhaps we could never re reclaim the grasslands they once were. Um, in Salina, Kansas, this wonderful group has been experimenting for now decades, thinking about how to rebuild the plains as it once was and maybe use those crops into and enter those crops into our uh, onto our plates. You mean West uh, Jackson and the Land Institute? Yeah, West Jackson. Yeah, the Land Institute. And, you know, I think that's a really intriguing concept. And a, and a fascinating way to think about a future minus the aquifer. So, yes, on the one hand, we can say, look, we found this resource, we've exploited it, it's now gone. But that also means the human ecology is gone. All of those communities that have been built up around it, Garden City, Kansas, and places like that, will will no longer be or certainly be much less than what they are. And to get an example of that, just drive through western Nebraska, there's far, far fewer people today there than there was in the late 1890s, and that's a consequence, right, of the very same kinds of things that you're describing. So the human ecology will change. I think the physical landscape itself, there's also been this argument about sort of returning this to the commons, uh, in a sense, to the Buffalo commons, where, where we no longer do the kind of high-scale agriculture, but in fact, Bring back the buffalo, bring back the bison in a sense, because we can't do anything else. But all of that is at such a vast scale that it is powerfully unsettling to me to try to think out what the, what the result might look like. You know, in the book, we have this um, wonderful line or set of lines that, that um, Madison and Jefferson are talking about um, this region. And their understanding of it is a landscape that is poor, that is um, may never be sufficient number of habitants, Madison says, to entitle them to membership in the Confederacy, and by which he means the nation, the Republic. Um, and, you know, Jefferson sort of concluded that it might take a hundred generations to actually populate that area. Well, it took about five, and we're going to see a massive depopulation over the rest, the next five, would be my guess. So we may actually go back to that Jeffersonian world that is seemingly inhospitable. Um, and, you know, we'll tell stories like we have in this book of, you know, the golden age on the Ogallala. But I think there's some loss there, huge losses that are environmental on the one hand and human on the other. And I don't think we tend to count very much. We don't reckon with those losses terribly well. But let me let me change the subject just slightly. What if the spigots went off tomorrow, Char, and, 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 and no more water were available from the Ogallala? 
what does that do? I mean, obviously, there's an exodus from the Western Great Plains, but what does that do to food prices? What what does that do to the larger economy? And I think that's part of the story that was really important for us to tell in the in this third edition. Not just in terms of the investment capital that has flown in, um, but the the resource, the food that has moved across the planet. I mean, if you shut off those spigots food insecurity around the world increases rapidly and immediately. I mean, these are not just feeding Americans, even though that's what we talk about. They are feeding the world. And that becomes an enormous um, concept. It's great economically when it works. Uh, We're reaping billions of dollars as a consequence of the productivity of our irrigation-fed agriculture. Um, But if you turn off the irrigating, I mean, that's why It's so unnerving to think about this particular water resource being one of the most um, endangered effectively in the United States because we know just how crucial it is to food supplies elsewhere in the world. Gentlemen, we need to take a short break. We'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Hello, everyone. It's Clay Jenkinson, just sneaking in a little announcement between segments of the Jefferson Hour. I want you to join me this winter at Loxaw Lodge, west of Missoula, for two humanities cultural retreats. The first one, Water in the West, January 13th through 18th, and the second, Shakespeare Without Tears, January 19th through 24th. For more information, go to our website, jeffersonhour.com forward slash tours. We'll see you in the mountains. Welcome back to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. I'm Clay Jenkins, sitting across from my dear friend and the semi-permanent guest host That's me. of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. David Swenson. I think you have a question for our guest, Char Miller. I do. First, I want to congratulate you on this third edition of, of, of the book, Ogallala, Water for a Dry Land. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, it's a fascinating read. I want to change the subject a little bit, go away from water. And, and talk about dirt. <laughs> there's, there's, this, uh-huh. there's this great section early in the book where you explain soils and what's perfect and the breakdown of the nutrients and how farmers during yeah. that period would recognize this perfect soil and the elements that, you know, I think about Jefferson and the, the red clay soil in Virginia. Right. Right. Yeah. And, you know, the language of ecological capital, which I also love, um, you know, trying to think of ways that you can capture two things simultaneously that don't seem to go together. I mean, if you think about ecological, uh, you don't tend to think about capital or capitalism. But but in truth, it is. It is the thing that that turns that soil. um, um, And as we write, it turns it into a kind of miraculous balance of the right chemicals and salts and, and, you know, sodium and hydrogen and all these other um, elements. I mean, it's just... It's it's complex. It's complex. It's really complex. And yet these these farmers during that period, uh, they recognized it. They understood it. We know Jefferson did. You know, Adams was a fanatic about uh, uh, making the the best possible... uh, Manure. Manure, yeah. (laughs) Manure, yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, and I think that's... I think that's... um, I won't say it's a lost art, but I think it is... It was an art totally was an art for them to be able to see that. And I think now that we know that you can mix chemicals and produce fertility, not really soil, but fertility, um, we don't look at land in the same way anyway. I know, you know, not having grown up a farm, that that was not something that ever entered my mind. Um, But but having worked on this project for long enough, you begin to recognize that the the concept, the husbandman, it's a really interesting term. Um, all of all of the sort of you know patriarchal stuff aside, you really are married to and trying to produce a kind of fertile um, landscape that's going to whatever the crop is that you want to grow, and and you you sustain it. And I think those are concepts that are. Um, I think we think our technology will save us in ways that we also see that technology produces the very thing that destroys us. And I wish we could see the salvation piece more clearly in a sustained way uh, without us having blinders on to what might happen if we don't do it right. Well, you know, I have some experience out there, and it seems to me that the chemistry is 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 far and away dominating the um, the stewardship and the artistry. 
yes. of agriculture. Yes. So if you go to the right agricultural chemist, that person will say, if you put X seed on that field and Y pesticide and Z fertilizer and, and R water, you will produce a crop. Yes. And yes, the soil, exactly. in some sense, is the least important part of it now. That's just the medium in which it happens, but it's the chemicals that are growing that food. Exactly right. And there are even people out there who have tried to put chemistry in the pumps themselves rather than uh, spray on the pesticides and herbicides with tractors they've tried to put them into the uh, into the ogallala water fortunately that's mostly been um, abandoned as a really really dangerous practice because those chemicals really, then can seep back down yes. into the aquifer but i can remember going out with my father-in-law to to move pipe and we would actually be um, at the pumps and there would be two v8 engines running at top torque uh, with almost no muffling, and he would say, hand me that that pliers, and he would be shouting at the top of his lungs to me four oh, feet God. away, and I would oh, be saying, God. what, what did you say? And so you have this idea, it's like a, um, a 747 plane landing, yes. and he, I'm yes. handing him pipes, oh, and we're why? moving these things, and then we think, well, we're Jeffersonian farmers, aren't we? And you think, well, there's a paradox <laughs> there, right? I mean, they may be individuals, yes. but we're using, we're right. at the apex of a gigantic petrochemical and industrial system that enables yes. that to be a quote-unquote Jeffersonian farm. And and the scale, as you said, it was huge, right? And that's just one farm of thousands in that area. Um, and it has to be that big in part because you can't, I mean, because of uh, natural precipitation, you, you've, you've got to have a lot of land to do the kind of work that, you're, that you hope to uh, till in some fashion. But no, it is the most corporatized um, landscape, I would say, in the in the biggest sense. That is to say, the the fusion of money and technology, um, the agricultural sciences. I mean, all of the land grant universities in the Great Plains, fabulous institutions, are predicated on teaching that it isn't the soil is simply a medium; it is a, a means to an end because we can we can amend it, we can amend it to whatever we want it to be. Um, and then you've got all of the extraordinary. Um, combines and everything else that just, frankly, boggle my mind, the size and scale of them and the sort of technological processes that they are able to do in the degree to which they do it is amazing. But that is not what Jefferson had in mind. Not quite. So, so Char, let me ask you a couple of uh, uh, final questions. First of all, sure. why did you write this book? And why do you reissue this book? Oh, that's a great question. So, so, and it, and it, and John Opie was the original sole author of the book. John is now in his 80s, um, and he and Nebraska felt that this was a time for a third edition, probably the last one, um, because it it so much had changed over the last 20 years uh, from the previous one, which came out in two. John basically finished writing it in 99, and it came out in 2000, 2001. So part of the What's changed is not only the globalized nature of this agriculture, but the even more clear um, expectation that the Ogallala, this water for a dry land, the water is running out and the dryness of the land is going to increase. And there was sort of this really interesting moment in which we, John thought, and the University of Nebraska thought, um, you know, this is, this is a good moment to bring it out. But John's health is failing. Um, and he felt he needed help. Um, turn, you know, he called me and I said, are you kidding? I'd love that book. I'd do anything to help bring that book about. Um, and then Kenna Lang Archer, who's at Angelo State, is a, um, um, a wonderful young historian, has written a beautiful book on the Brazos River in Texas, absolutely glorious piece of work. Um, we roped her in, and you know, part of what we did was to go from every one sentence after the next, reworking text, reworking ideas, and then because so much had happened over the last 20 years um, since the second edition, was to really build out um, and add in updates and revising and thinking out, well, wait a second, you know, they had this argument 20 years ago, where are we now? And lo and behold, they're still having the same argument and not much had changed. And that for me was both 
depressing um, and revelatory because it meant that all of these conservation districts, and we write a lot about a lot of them because we felt that that was a mechanism by which they could be saving themselves and their future generations' life on these lands. For all of the good work that they're able to do, there's also a, um, um, a constraint economically. People want to make their money. And that does as much as they might cooperate. Um, the water is the the most essential thing to this this productive enterprise. So we did a lot of reworking. We talked. We did a long chapter on T. Boone Pickens, who was trying to grab as much of the Ogallala and Texas as he could get his hands on. He failed. Um, but it, in and of itself, that's a whole other story of who's trying to get this water and and for what purposes. Um, and so we were really excited to put all of that together and get a chance to tell the story one more time um, in a way that was consistent with the world that we knew it to be, and then add in questions of climate change. Uh, because we know a lot more today than we did then 20 years ago about the impact of it. And, you know, even as this book was in its final stages of production, we were switching terms and because new things were coming out and we were trying to it was, close to our own time as we could, um, rewrite to the last moment. So, Char, this is a, an important book. It's well-written. It's, a, it's a, really, I would urge everyone to uh, to get a copy. Ogallala Water for a Dry Land, John Opie, Char Miller, and Kenna Lang Archer. Let me ask you a last question here. So, Wes Jackson at the Land Institute has been at this for 25 years. He's a genius. He won the MacArthur Prize. You have the American Prairie Reserve in Montana that's trying to create a, um, a three million acre buffalo ranch without fences. Uh, you have the Popper's thesis that the the Great Plains are really best suited to grazing, and we should revert to something like that. If you went out into the town I lived in, Sharon Springs, Kansas, and mentioned the poppers, you'd be lynched. They're still really controversial out there. West Jackson hasn't exactly changed the world. The American Prairie Reserve is a modest little public-private partnership in east-central Montana. Uh, my point is that the dominant paradigm is still dominant. And if you went to the my kin out on the Ogallala and said, you know you're doing something unsustainable, They'd say, well, we kind of get that, but what would you like us to do, Professor Miller? What exactly do you want us to do here? This is my family. I'm sending my children right. to college. This is food for America. So if you were the water czar, if, if, and I know that's not the kind of model you would want for this change, but if you were suddenly the water czar and you could advise the Ogallala occupants, what would you tell them? I would tell them that um, to think about those places in the past that were utterly dependent upon water um, and that found themselves in deep jeopardy because they didn't act in time. Um, and they've already known that. I mean, the, the Ogallala, Ogallala region went through this with the Dust Bowl. Um, that's only, what, 80 years ago, 85 years ago? Um, we, we have a very close analog that we need to be thinking about, and not that the dust storms are necessarily going to come back, but the full-on human loss that occurred as a result of that ought to be fresh in people's minds. And I recognize that part of the way you make it not fresh in your mind is to basically pivot, irrigate everything, right? You, you, we've got the water now. We figured out the problem. Well, actually, that is the problem. Um, and so I think part of what, I mean, it has to be done delicately. It has to be done thoughtfully and, and with some sense. Um, but I think one of the things that Teddy Roosevelt, Gifford Pinchot, and that generation also taught us and gave us the language that I would have hoped would be more dominant than it is today, which is about resilience. And which is about thinking out, not just for my generation and my children's generation, but what are their grandkids going to do? What are their great grandkids going to do? And if we have as a model, the fact that our work, whatever that work is, needs to better the world, then I think we can start to have a conversation about some of the ways by which to do this in a collaborative process across the plains, because you're right. The Land Institute hasn't made a big mark in this world. Um, we can have all of the prairie grass uh, preserves at a small scale that we want, um, but but that doesn't feed the world. And I think one of the ways grimly to think about this is that we're pumping so much water out of the Ogallala, we're pumping so much water out of the California aquifers, multiple, um, that those places may not, by the end of this century, continue to be 
the extraordinarily productive terrain that they have been. And that's going to be devastating. A really important book, Ogallala, Water for a Dry Land, third edition, University of Nebraska Press, John Opie, um, Kenneth Lang Archer, and my friend Char Miller. What are you working on now, sir? Well, I actually, I just this week, actually today, a book on San Antonio, Texas comes out in, in sort of commemoration of its 300th anniversary. And as you well know, we have just edited a collection of really fine essays and chapters for a book on Teddy Roosevelt. So I'm hoping for that to come out in the next year or so. Yeah, during the anniversary of, of Roosevelt's death. Uh, so this is this is terrific. When you are ready to go to Wallace County, Kansas, I will meet you there. And I will be your wingman, and we'll set up a little town oh, meeting. Yeah. And I will introduce yeah. you and say you have some thoughts on the Ogallala. And, uh, <laughs> and I'll, I'll keep the car running in the parking lot, my friend. What a great time talking with you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Clay. Thanks, David. Talk to you soon. Uh, it's a great read. I uh, encourage you to check the book. Uh, go to jeffersonhour.com, and you can find more out uh, about that book. But uh, before we go this week, I, you know, I, I still have this image from our the beginning of the show of Jenkinson the farmer in the fields of Kansas. When I got married, my wife had a walker, this extraordinary woman, was a grain elevator operator. Oh, I didn't know that. That in itself made me I thought she was a lawyer. Well, she became one. Uh So she's this grain elevator operator. She lives on this farm out in western Kansas. So I go there, and we're married, and we live there for a couple of years. And so my father-in-law looked upon me as like an English major, you know, like a nerd, Uh dangerous. But he let me do some things. And I won't tell the story of how I nearly burned the farm down that time. And I won't tell the story of how I saved the 500 sheep in the terrible blizzard that, that came through well, that, well, that other time. Well. There are lots of stories about my life as a farmer, but I'll tell you just this little one. My father-in-law did not trust me with combines or anything very serious. A, a wise father-in-law. Uh, but he did let me cultivate some corn. Huh. Have you ever, ever done this? Uh, no, I haven't. So a cultivator is a, like a weeding machine that goes between the furrows, right. the rows of corn. And you have to line up the cultivator precisely, otherwise it takes out the corn rather than the weeds. Not what you want to and do. And so he shot, you know, he taught me how to drive a tractor, and he taught me how to line it up, and we went on a few rounds, and he said, all right, you're on your own, and I would do this. And he'd come back about every three hours, and he'd say, huh, yeah, avoid the cultivator blight, meaning that I was actually cutting down corn rather than weeds because lining it up is very, very difficult. And you have to concentrate. You can't just sit back. You know, It's not like driving a highway in the American West. You concentrate every second. Anyway, this is this huge field. It's the size of a, it's a whole section, and I'm doing this day after day. And I'm, I usually leave the tractor out there and just drive like my car to the edge of the field. But one day he said, bring the tractor in because we need to make a couple of adjustments. So at the end of the day, I'm to bring the tractor with this gigantic 40-foot cultivator on the back of it. The tractor is bigger than anything I've ever been in. Back to the farm, it's about a mile away. And I would go around the field looking for a way to get out of the field. <laughs> but there was a ditch. You know, there's the ditch where the road and the field. Yeah. And I was afraid that if I went down it, I'd topple the whole thing and be killed or worse. And so I couldn't find a way out. And so I went three or four or five times around this whole field looking for an exit that wouldn't create chaos. Finally, he came out and said, I'll do it. And he knew that I was lost out there. So he then we, we brought the cultivator in and we, and we made the adjustments. And the next day he said, all right, you, I, think, I think I can trust you to take it back and go by the same route we came. And I said, oh, no problem. So I'm in the driveway of this Quonset. I'm driving out and the back of the, I, I hear this noise in the back of the cultivator is taking out all of the um, mailboxes on the property. <laughs> A state highway sign. <laughs> I'm I'm knocking things over all the way back out to the field. And so that was sort of the end of my life as a corn cultivator. And I did not damage the tractor or uh, the cultivating um, machine, but I did some damage to the mailboxes and to the state highway sign. And so after that, I was given some more genteel work to do on that Jeffersonian farm. So that, that's my life as a Jeffersonian. But I loved it. I tell you, I loved it, and I boast about it all the time. Well, great conversation this week. Thank you, and uh, your your true confessions. And we'll... Thanks to Char Miller. Sometime I'll tell you the story of how I almost burned the farm down. We'll see you next week for another exciting edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education. The program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public Radio. 
President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826, and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author, Clay S. Jenkinson. To obtain a copy of this or any past show for a $12 donation, please call 888-828-2853. Again, that number is 888 888- 828-2853. This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.org and on iTunes. If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.org. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is produced at Makoche Recording Studios in Bismarck, North Dakota. Music by Stephen Swinford. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking, historically accurate program through the eyes of Thomas Jefferson.